I'd like to introduce our speakers who are speaking on the topic of can social prescribing help improve our health and well-being challenges? And this will be done in, within the context of, as I said, seniors. Our speakers, our presenters, Heather Bershaw and Rob Miyashiro, both of whom have extensive experience working with the seniors population and in various community projects. And at this time, I'm happy to turn it over to them. And I believe we start with Rob, is that correct? Yeah, yeah I'm not, not quite as tall as Bob, so we have to adjust this. So, so I'm gonna talk to you in, in general about why we are doing what we're doing and what the importance of it is. And then Heather's gonna talk to you about the nuts and bolts about our, about our um, social prescribing project in Lethbridge. Just about every single new uh, seniors minister or social services minister um, sees this pot of money called FCSS. Oh, by the way, um, we, we put a glossary sheet on your table because we use a lot of jargony stuff. And we thought it'd be best, rather than, than us explain every little thing that we're talking about, if you don't know what we're, what we're saying, refer to that, please, because it, it would just, it, it'd be long. Every sector does this. So FCSS is 80% um, is funded by the province, 20% by municipalities, and is specifically for early intervention and prevention services. Every single new minister to that portfolio that oversees that looks at that money and goes, oh, there's a few million dollars here that we have no idea what it does, so why don't we just take it away? Because they don't understand. And this is, this is not um, uncommon for almost every new, new minister. Um, there's some, obviously, they're a little bit more enlightened than others, but there are some, um, and this happened when the UCP government um, came into power in 2019, is their very first Minister of Social Services looked at this money and was, was making waves in, in the sector saying, hey, maybe we don't need all this money in there. So that was the impetus for some of our, our organizations in Lethbridge that deal with seniors um, and are funded through FCSS to say, hey, wait a second. Um, if they're going to cut, uh, we need to figure out a way that we can provide service to our community um, and have the cuts not affect us as, as drastically as they could. So at that time, we were starting a, an idea at LSCO to do some outreach programs, programming. Um, we gathered some of our colleagues um, in, this, in the senior sector that are funded through FCSS through the city and said, hey, we, uh, we got this idea. So we want to form a partnership and we want to provide services for the community, but we have to do it together. Because if there's five positions, and all of a sudden we lose 20% of the funding for our, our section in FCSS, we still have four people left to do the work. Um, and after some, uh, some back and forth, I think we reached an agreement that this is probably a good way to do it. Um, I guess in all honesty, um, our partners at first thought I was trying to take all their money and they were, they were a little bit reluctant to, to agree to that. But once they understood the big picture of how this would work and what everybody's role was and how the funding would work, um, jump right on board. So we've been doing this um, as a group and having these talks since 2019. So in 2020, um, under Heather's direction, we started, we started providing these outreach services to the community. And we were the only seniors organization in Lethbridge that provided outreach services to seniors in our community during the COVID restrictions. Um, and, and it was, <laughs> they were very busy, um, but we were, we were pretty proud of the fact that we were the only ones doing that because a lot of people were just closed. They weren't, they weren't working from offices, they were, and some of them weren't even working from home at that point. So, so what we want to do is make sure that we, we had all these different places working together. Lethbridge Housing Authority, Norbridge Seniors, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, Volunteer Lethbridge, uh, Lethbridge Family Services, um, the, the Counseling and Education Department, all working together to provide services. And Heather's going to talk to you a bit more about the nuts and bolts of that. So we, we formed a formal partnership, we did a, a memorandum of agreement, and we created a seniors services ecosystem within the city's funding model, um, which, which it was a gift to the city. Because when they went to look at, at their 
um, priorities and seniors is a priority for um, the municipal social services, they looked at what we created and, and fully were on board because then they didn't have to do any planning around it because we already did. Um, so, I don't know which one to hit here. So where does that lead us to? So then we were doing this work and then all of a sudden we hear about this thing called social prescribing because I'd never heard of it. Heather might have heard of it. I never heard of it. I just do stuff and hopefully it works. Um, so we hear from our provincial colleagues in Calgary and Edmonton because I was on the Community Leaders Council for Healthy Aging Alberta um, that that this whole social prescribing thing is happening. And we, we were met with some um, people from across the country actually to look at what social prescribing was doing across the country. And we said, oh, we're doing that. Little did I know. Heather might have known, but I didn't know that. So we, we eventually became part of this network in Canada and in Alberta uh, for social prescribing. And we connect through Healthy Aging Core Alberta, which is a, um, uh, online resource and education resource for seniors, uh, senior service providers. We, we also have been part of the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing in that we connect with um, um, practitioners from across the country, talk about best practice, and we, um, we realize that what we've created in Lethbridge is the best practice for seniors outreach and senior support. I mean, I'll talk about that a bit more towards the end. So once we've discovered that, we were, we were actually able to get some funding from a national um, uh, foundation that wants to create social prescribing programs in, in various provinces. So, so Lethbridge, with our uh, Seniors Community Service Partnership, um, Lethbridge, uh, Calgary through Caria and Edmonton through Sage um, are forming our own Alberta, Made in Alberta social prescribing system. Uh, Heather's going to talk about that a bit more. And, and what we're doing is trying to create our own, uh, our own practices, our own way of doing work, our own common terminology and our own common data collection systems. And we're going to do that um, in order to serve our, our seniors population a lot better in our province. So on that note, um, I'm going to let Heather talk about the nuts and bolts of this and that's it for me for now. I'm not as short as Rob. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Ow. I got to work with them every day. So, um, I'm not a brushed speaker like Rob, so I do have my notes here that I'm going to be referencing. Um, I did come up with a slideshow just to give you guys kind of an overview of uh, what the work that our team does every day. Um, and like Rob mentioned about social prescribing, I don't think we really realized it was social prescribing until the term kind of started to hit locally and then we realized wait a minute that's actually what we've developed already um, and then we're included in some provincial discussions about how do we make sure that we're doing things the best way um, and consistently consistently throughout the province so the seniors community service partnership is the partnership that rob mentioned where numerous organizations who are seniors focused uh, decided to come together to support the city um, collaboratively so within that there was various um, goals that we wanted to achieve um, making sure that we were addressing all the areas that were most important when it comes to older adults um, kind of the the center of the partnership is the senior systems navigator team and that's actually outreach workers so um, they're human service based professionals at this point point, uh, I think eight out of nine of them are registered social workers. Um, so that's the background that they bring. Um, and the focus is really to make sure that um, they're providing hands-on support to vulnerable seniors, seniors in need, and that we're shifting the way work is delivered from here's a phone number, go to this organization, go over here for that, and actually helping them through that making phone calls, supporting them to go into places, especially the healthcare system, which is really overwhelming and very complicated, and making sure that people are getting what they needed and not caught in the systems as they are. So the logos at the bottom of the slide are the organizations that were initially funded with a position um, specifically to have an outreach worker. So um, LSCO had myself and one other staff person. Um, Lethbridge Housing had two, and they were housed in the seniors' buildings that they have in the city. 
Norbridge had one, and then CMHA had one, and they actually um, housed theirs in the library, but they were a bit more mobile, so they'd go between the senior centers, and um, they wanted to be where seniors were. So this was kind of the um, initial um, plan, was to have people in the community that were hands-on support. Um, over the last two years of operation, so that started in 2021, um, we, we really refined, we kind of just started doing it and we really didn't know what we were doing <laughs> to start with because it was the pandemic and there was lots of gaps and so we were just kind of doing everything that we could. Um, and over time we've kind of tried to refine that a little bit by ensuring that our team is focusing on um, folks over the age of 60. There are resources for adults, there are resources for family, there are resources for children, um, but it was really a gap. We know that there are people with uh, specialized knowledge and specific knowledge for older adults was, was a gap. Um, to coordinate the supports that we were providing, we created a centralized phone number so that regardless of where people were calling from or where people, whether they were attached to this senior center or that senior center, it didn't matter. It was just a, an opportunity for people to get help. And so we found that having one phone number was helpful. We made sure that our team members were stationed throughout the city, um, not necessarily in offices, but they were in places where it was easy to find them. Um, all of the work done by the team was supported by myself in terms of clinical direction. So I met with the team and made sure that we were delivering um, appropriate supports and that all of the work was supervised properly. Um, also that allowed us to, uh, a lot of other partners and other organizations who did meet with seniors would call on us for help. So they'd say, we have this happening, we'd like you guys to help us. So it also allowed us to reach out and kind of fill some of our gaps with other partners in the community as well, um, which has been really helpful. Um, and then it, it, having the supports in the senior centers um, specifically, it allowed us to be really easily accessible to the in-home supports. So the Meals on Wheels volunteers, the Meals on Wheels at home who are vulnerable and isolated, um, the subsidized housekeeping, so people that are um, trying to stay at home, trying to plug in as many supports as possible. Um, as the housekeepers, as the volunteers identified issues, um, they brought those back in-house and we were able to go out and meet with them and, and kind of explore the situation a little bit quicker and get supports in place for them. We also did that for um, the elder abuse response case manager who is housed in LSCO as well. And then we worked a lot with um, dis folks that were discharged from the regional hospital. Um, just kind of uh, more recently, we've started to target the primary care networks, the doctor's clinics in town, and that's specifically in relation to the social prescribing work that we're starting to do. Um, the workers would identify needs, um, support connections to resources, uh, facilitate community connections and peer supports, um, offer hands-on outreach-based involvement, provide emotional support and education, and then the big one is advocating within complex systems, whether that's financial systems, government systems, healthcare systems, um, there's a lot of them. Uh, Lethbridge Family Services was our partner who was really interested in exploring counseling resources for older adults. Um, so we know traditionally older adults didn't seek counseling, don't maybe know um, if they would be interested. It wasn't uh, a traditionally a way of coping, um, but really knowing that there is value in therapeutic relationships and counseling um, relationships with people. Um, so what Lethbridge Family Services started doing is providing single session counseling, which is free. Um, here in LSCO, we started here we did that for about a year and then we transitioned over to include Norbridge in that. So twice a month, a counselor is on site for anybody that might wanna talk to somebody. The way I pitch it to people who are reluctant is um, try it. It's free, it's an opportunity to give it a try and see what you think. Um, and that's resulted, um, when I did the annual satisfaction surveys, I think we had about 85% of the people that had trialed it go continue on with longer term counseling. So it's really meant to be um, bringing initiatives and allowing people to access them easily in a comfortable location without paperwork and all of the barriers that go along with that. 
uh, volunteerism. So Volunteer Lethbridge was our partner um, when we established the partnership, really to screen, recruit, and promote um, some, of the, some of the opportunities within all of the partnering agencies. Um, we also f found this valuable because it would allow um, the navigators, the outreach team, to connect with Volunteer Lethbridge and come up with unique opportunities for seniors who are looking to be involved and participate in things. An so example of this is we have um, seniors that have actually supported other seniors by packing things and preparing them when they're no longer able to stay at home and they need to move into supported living or um, actually physically moving things. So um, bringing a truck, <laughs> putting the bed in the truck, hauling it over to the next place, moving resources are extremely expensive and so for seniors on a fixed income, that's not attainable. Uh, our in-home support programs, um, so these are things offered in-house, Meals on Wheels, subsidized housekeeping, lawn care and snow removal, and then Community Connect. So these are other contributions that LSCO made in terms of the partnership and what we really wanted to leverage within all the agencies where an outreach worker was housed is um, we want to be able to give people these resources to help them stay in their home longer um, or else when there's needs arise we want to be able to be um, accessed and available um, for people that are struggling um, to stay in home. Community Connect is a relatively new program that was run by um, Volunteer Lethbridge throughout the pandemic, which was a, a friendly phone call to an isolated senior without supports. Um, so Volunteer Lethbridge got it up and running, and then um, when the funding contract for that expired, it moved over to LSCO and is part of um, the resources that we try to provide here. Um, peer support services, um, again, making sure we're identifying needs and we have resources that are easily accessible. Um, examples of those are on-site legal visits, so a lawyer comes and provides a free consultation to people who might have a question. Um, we have foot care, we have other professionals coming, and we try to have those um, offered frequently and easily accessible again so that people can get that need met, especially with um, some of the challenges in the healthcare system right now with um, accessing resources. Um, the other part I wanted to mention is it was really the partnership was also really meant to be a collaborative partner. So within our own um, agreement, we were working together, but we really wanted to be able to work closely with um, elder abuse. Obviously, that's um, uh, something that's been operational in our community for quite some time, the program, um, and th their um, ability to respond to all of the things as one person in one program is quite limited. So um, we really wanted to be able to support other seniors alongside the case manager. Um, again, Alberta Health Services, so working with um, emergency, uh, the transition services and home care, um, and, the, and then more recently working with primary care and healthy aging Alberta. I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the impact that we've noted. So this is just, um, I just finished up the report for 2022 um, regarding um, the referrals and the amount of people we supported and how we supported them. Um, and so the reasons for referral, um, we really saw shift from during the pandemic to after the pandemic. And so at this point, uh, the largest chunk of this graph is blue, and that's housing concerns. And I think everyone's aware that there's a, a bit of a housing crisis in terms of affordable. Um, and for us, it's more accessible housing. There's lots of, um, housing options, but a lot of them aren't accessible um, for people with physical dif uh, dis difficulties. This is a strange blue. Sorry? This is a strange blue. That's a, so we'll call it blacky, browny blue. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> Good? OK. Um, the yellow chunk is finances. So um, this, obviously, with inflation, has been extremely difficult for seniors who are on a fixed income. Uh, they can't just go make more money. They can't just go get a job to offset some of the costs that are coming along with um, the way things are looking these days when you go to the grocery store or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and then the, the green component there is um, emotional and mental health. Um, and so throughout the pandemic, I think that was actually quite a bit smaller. And as we come out, we're really noticing people um, 
didn't have connections for a long time and that really impacted them. So um, we're really trying to understand how we can safely promote and it, get people together in get connected to peers and places where they can have um, uh, meaningful relationships because people are extremely isolated. Um, many are choosing still not to come into communal settings. Um, and so the navigators are really working hard on trying to um, develop relationships and build that sense of safety for people. The next slide is where referrals are coming from. Oh, my colors are different than your guys's. Okay. Uh, the big chunk at the bottom, which is red for you guys, brown. brown for you guys, that's self. So these are people that just find us themselves. So they either call LSCO, they call Norbridge, um, they're a, a resident in one of the LHA buildings. Um, they just call us and say, I think, uh, I think you guys can help me. You're a senior center. Where do I go for this? Where do I go for that? Um, the uh, green. <laughs> is family. Lots of family mem younger families will call and say, where do I get help for my loved one? Yellow is healthcare professionals. So those are coming from um, most often emergency, acute care, discharges, transition services. And then the blue is our own partners. So those are ones that come specifically from Meals on Wheels or other programs that we already, um, already run. So what I wanted to mention about this, why I put this in here, is I feel like um, sometimes the self-referrals are one, people will say, call here, call here, call here, call here. Here's all the places that might help you. And so what I would like to see as we work through social prescribing is that um, professional resort, uh, professional referrals, so the, the yellow will actually grow, and it will be a facilitated handoff. It won't be, here, phone this number, and maybe somebody can help you, because I think that is not really what anybody ever wants to hear. <laughs> Call and maybe someone will help you. You want to know that the resource you're being given is the right one, and that's really what we're trying to do with social prescribing. Um, just in regards, I, I just quickly looked up this morning. Um, we did also gather some information about um, how we're doing with these resources um, and, and kind of are we achieving the outcomes we're supposed to achieve. Um, and I just thought I would mention that um, we, we reach out to many people. We ask how we're doing. We have specific questions we ask. Um, and those have resulted in 96% of, of the people that are receiving services through the partnership um, feel that it's contributing to their ability to stay in their own home. 80% of those people know that they can have, that there are community resources available and easily accessed. And then 88% of those people know that they can rely on us for future needs and things as things transition for them. So I'm just going to move, I, I have a few slides left specifically about social prescribing. Um, as Rob mentioned, um, we were doing it, but we didn't know we were doing it. Um, and so what's happened now is there's a very big movement happening across the province to take the initial, the individual projects that are happening in Lethbridge, Edmonton, and Calgary, and standardizing them so that it doesn't matter where you live. Um, also, there, the goal is to expand to other communities as well once we kind of get our bearings. Um, but this is really the picture that we're trying to, to work with, is that we know a lot of health issues um, are a result of the social determinants of health and some um, barriers in making sure that everyone's standard of living is being achieved. Um, we know that the uh, population of older adults is growing, and we know that people want to stay in their homes. They don't want to go into living environments. So it's really important that we have um, resources and a, a, a standard where people can access things in their own home, and that's the expectation, not here's the, the medical, here's the medicine, or here's the facility that will help you. Um, so this is very small, but what it is, is it's basically a person's journey through social prescribing. They show up at their doctor, they're describing, um, you know, a, a loss, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a spouse. Um, what the target is in social prescribing is making healthcare professionals aware that there's social resources to help people with medical, as, as part of their medical um, 
needs. So um, healthcare providers might acknowledge that there's depression, might acknowledge that there's loneliness, might acknowledge that there's actually some social needs that could assist this individual who's showing up within the medical system seeking support. And so those professionals would then actually provide a referral down to places like us to get involved with that older adult and make connections in places where they need to be made. Really hoping to relieve some of the pressure from healthcare. We all know that the healthcare system is overwhelmed right now, and it's difficult to get where we need to go in the healthcare system. And so it's really meant to support healthcare. Well, the medical professionals provide medical support. There's also social um, uh, social consequences as part of those medical issues. Am I good? I could see I was getting the time, the time there. So, um, so I, I quickly went through that, and, and like I said, I just it's it's relatively new for us as we merge our program into what the provincial standards will look like. There will likely be um, some changes to how we're doing things, um, but our next steps really are working in those primary care clinics, working with doctors, and working with um, the medical teams that are seeing people in. Um, in the community to get connected to us in an easy way. All right, now this is the Q&A period. You know the drill. Keep your comments short and your questions to the point. And name. And your name, thank you. My name is Henning Mundell. Thank you for your presentation, and uh, like Rob mentioned, I had no idea what you're doing in social prescribing. I have a much better idea now. And you did a great job in uh, breaking down sort of where the referrals come. Uh, my concern and question relates to referrals, people that may not know about you, and part and parcel of that, the senior homeless. So do you have any kind of plans or processes or methods of de handling that? Yeah. Um, sure, so what I can speak to in terms of um, making sure people know about us is I try to get ourselves in all sorts of places. Posters, um, uh, we attend many community things, we all have matching t-shirts. I know it sounds corny, but it's the best way to get people to go, well, who are they and what are, what are they all about? So I, I do try to get places, um, but no, um, as social prescribing becomes more um, prevalent, the, the awareness that there will likely be um, more visibility in um, medical systems about it. Um, so one of the clinics I'm currently working with um, wants do you guys know those TVs in the doctor's office where things roll by? They want me to come up with some slides to go on there. So that will go in those offices. They want little write-ups that they can leave in their clinics. So those are some of the things that we'll be doing. Um, in terms of the homeless seniors, we know about them and we are already supporting them. So what happens is um, the cities defined our partnership as population specialists. So we, um, as a partnership, are tasked with being aware and being on top of what is happening for older adults in Lathbridge. Um, and so any agencies that work with homelessness um, across the age continuum are um, no of us and they say help us because we don't know um, and so the biggest issue we're dealing with right now is housing for them because um, traditional housing isn't the right option and so they're unfortunately living continuing to live in homelessness living in hotels um, but really needing a bit more of a structured supported environment due to age-related issues so we definitely get referrals from them from professionals who work a lot with homelessness saying we need you to help us because we we don't know what to do. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Herzliche Glückwünsche zum Geburtstag, Hans Hennig. But uh, uh, sorry, Shannon Phillips. Um, 
I have a quick question for Heather. It's, uh, it's what I call a queen of the world question. So you have about four or five uh, social workers working right now on this project. If you were to wave a magic wand and expand these uh, uh, programs, uh, what would that look like? How many more, uh, how many more resources could this uh, uh, really use regionally even? Um, and uh, the second part of that would be around that housing question. You, you flagged accessible housing. Um, what would those kinds of short-term investments look like? What should be on our horizon? in there that sounds like a really big question okay I will do my best um, uh, magic wand wise um, I am hesitant and I actually was speaking to my provincial colleagues with social prescribing yesterday about I'm worried to go to all the clinics because I do believe they will see this as a valuable resource and when I think of my little team of five <laughs> I go oh boy I don't know how we could adequately keep up with because I know there's a whole um, group of older adults that don't know about us have never heard of this but also want to stay in their homes so want all these things to happen and want support to make it happen um, and so I, I am aware that there's not enough of us if we reach I think I counted there's 12 primary care clinics we're working in three of them right now so that's four times as many so one so just one thing to that Jen sorry Heather. so the National Health Service in in the UK um, has been doing this a lot longer than we have in Canada and their standard their projected standard for the number of um, they call them link workers, but it'd be the same as our SSNs, is I think it's 90 per million. So literally, that we'd need nine. So we would need at least three to four more in, in Lethbridge. And then the question about um, housing, um, I think that's a really tough one to answer um, because I think there's... Uh, many issues, um, social issues that people who are homeless experience and then they're also added um, on top of challenges related to aging and so um, when I look at what we have, um, we have great options but not one that's specialized with um, supports for people who've lived vulnerable lives their whole lives, um, have never lived in communal settings, have never had structure um, but need the components of like a lodge setting or somewhere with support so um, some version of that is what I believe is um, needed in our community um, we have a large number of homeless seniors that we work with um, and naively for myself working in AHS for as long as I did I didn't actually know many of them existed because I was working with a different component of older adults now that I work in this position I'm very aware that there's a large portion of older adults who are homeless Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, my question relates to funding. Uh, Rob, you were mentioning there was some federal involvement in this. Is any federal money available for? Uh, what about provincial money? I can, I can explain. <laughs> so, so can you, the the interesting part about what we're doing right now is we're we've, we've leveraged funding that was already given out by the city of Lethbridge through FCSS to form our own system. Um, the, the other money that I talked about is it's not federal, it's a, a foundation. It's a private foundation that's funding these initiatives across Canada. Because mm -hmm. they, um, every so many years, this foundation says, we want to see what we can do to push this forward. And for the next four or five years, um, this foundation is going to fund social prescribing initiatives across the, the country. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of provincial money, there's other other money to provide supports for social prescribing, um, and one of them is that um, the provincial government right now is providing some supports for um, Healthy Aging Alberta through the United Way of Calgary and area, and they're like our backbone for Healthy Age Alberta, who's also overseeing the dollars for um, for this private foundation dollars, right? We also just um, we also got some money from the. Um, the, the, no, the big, what was that fund? Um, uh, we got some money for regional uh, community developers um, through the provincial government. I can't remember exactly what that fund was called. 
uh, and and so that was a two and a half year project that is going to end, but then we're going to we're getting extra dollars right now put towards that, and so that's all going to help. What, what Heather was saying, it's all going to help connect those services in the different regions um, to to make that happen. Uh, could we use more money? Absolutely, but I mean, the difference though, just asking for more money is that. Um, and as long as I've been doing this kind of work is extra money is not always the, the answer and I think people that will know that that's true but it's how you use that that money that's um, that's the important part this is some of the best use of dollars that I've ever seen in in my four decades of doing social support work and, and program development right because we're doing it in partnership and we're doing it in collaboration, we're serving an entire community. We're not just serving like LSEO members or Norbridge members, we're serving the whole community. And I think that makes a huge difference in the connections that Heather talked about. It's how everyone works together for the best outcomes for seniors, um, probably the best way to go about it and the best way to use, use the dollars. Thanks to both of you for an excellent presentation. I'm Mary Shillington. Uh, I'm a retired clinical social worker, and I started in the social work program uh, here in Lethbridge in, in the early 90s. Now, there wasn't much as far as working with uh, seniors uh, in, in the program. And so uh, the fact that you're working as a group, as a team, um, I, I would hope you might somehow approach the University of Calgary and the division here in, in Lethbridge to encourage the program to develop something around seniors. And, and I know when I, I worked for 17 years at Lethbridge Family Services, so in that, we often had the team stuff. We got money if we were teaming. And so, uh, you know, maybe the program here uh, in social work would get more money if they, if they knew that your team wanted workers. So uh, have you got plans to, to do any of that? Uh, I actually have a master's student right now um, and another one wishing to come work um, with the social prescribing initiatives that we're doing in the fall. Um, and so when I shared that with Edmonton and Calgary, they said, hey, it would be a really good idea if we had a connection with the University of Calgary, specifically the social work program, but also public health, um, some of the other streams. Um, and so just last week, I sent my contact here um, to the project coordinator for all of the social prescribing initiatives in uh, the province to work on connecting those uh, because they saw the value for that to be specific to social work but also other um, helping professions. Yeah. Bev Mundell Atherstone, kudos to LSCO for this program and thank you very much for both of you for presenting this today. That's it's absolutely fabulous. Um, to follow up with Mary's point, uh, I was instrumental in setting up the Master of Counseling program at the university, and certainly you could uh, talk to them about having some of the practicum students here for your counseling uh, under supervision, of course. Yeah, so my, my actual question relates to um, seniors who are alone in their homes <clears throat> who, who can't get out. So it would be difficult to come here and engage in your many wonderful activities. And I'm wondering if you're working together with Lethbridge Housing Authority or the province or whoever else you've partnered with to look at the possibility of people who are alone in their house but do, really don't want to be living all alone and who would benefit from that social interaction with another person or persons. And do you know of any other programs, perhaps from the UK models, where you have various people living in one house, it's owned by one person, but the other people come there and live also. I know it with the matching and getting the personalities right would be really important, but um, that way you could increase the, the la you could reduce the loneliness of the individuals. Thank you so much. 
Well, that's a set. Of, that's I'm like, like that's set lots of questions. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, so do, I'll speak to the first part and let Rob speak to the second part. Uh, just about socialization um, opportunities, and that I think that was really our goal in having the Community Connect program move from the Keep in Touch, uh, sorry, move from Volunteer Lethbridge to LSCO. Um, was we really wanted it to be so it's a phone-based, um, well, a friendly call once a week, but we really wanted it to go beyond that where volunteers were encouraging people to um, embrace social opportunities um, and so you know that that comes with challenges and and one of the challenges is that people just aren't comfortable leaving their homes yet um, so in an effort to work th through that, we have um, one of our navigators is s tasked with relationship building with people and really investing in um, conversations, understanding what those barriers look like, and then coming up with creative ways to start the socialization process. Um, sometimes it's transporting, transportation is an issue, how can we get easy, um, uh, affordable rides? Um, we Sometimes our, some of our navigators do transport people, um, so we can encourage them to bring, uh, to come with their navigator. Um, but we are investing in how do we get people comfortable to try something. It might not be here, it might be Norbridge, it might be some other place, as long as it's somewhere, because we know that staying at home for that long hasn't been valuable. So it's definitely on our radar and we're trying to build those structures. Trying to help you. So, um, and the other thing about that, Bev, you were talking about the um, home sharing. Right, so there's two there's two existing um, um, organizations that that actually help coordinate home sharing across the country. One is called Canada Home Share, um, and literally it's you go live in someone's house and they have they have a social worker that that case manages it to make sure that there's no issues, and it's a not for profit organization. There's an organization out of Kelowna called Happy Pad, and they like to say that they're the um, um, Airbnb of seniors home sharing so literally it's if you have a space in your home and you want to make some extra income or you want someone to shovel your sidewalks or cook for you or something you make a deal with them about if your rent's a thousand dollars maybe it's only going to be eight hundred dollars if they do these other things for you or maybe so it works out that way we I was engaged in a lot of discussion with those guys bef before they got on, on, on online um, and I just have a lot of questions about those connections and, and what our liability would be um, in connecting those people. Uh, and same with Canada Home Share is a bit different because they actually use social workers to help help um, do those placements. So there, there are things like that available. Um, and I think we've been kind of so busy trying to get this other stuff going over the last few years that I think housing is the next thing that we need to tackle. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Bart Phillips, I'm going to let you give a shout out to your aspect of Community Connect because I started with Volunteer Lethbridge. I, it was during the pandemic, I think two and a half years ago, and I have worked with four seniors in that time. Three I'm still currently working with and one gentleman kind of dropped off the radar. But uh, here you have a nice captive audience of volunteer seniors that could help other seniors. And I just want to say I've developed awesome relationship with my two ladies, which is like, oh, they say, oh, it's you, Barb, when I phone. And, and now an, a new gentleman. And yes, for sure, the biggest issue was loneliness and isolation and, and then health issues, which get compounded. So anyway, yeah. sign up. You know what? You don't get paid, but you don't need to be. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barb. Thanks for that. I, that's definitely been um, a challenge is finding new people that are willing to do that once a week. So um, we have to get students um, wanting to fill volunteer hours from different um, 
uh, programs, but we do need it to be somewhat of a long-term commitment because it is building a relationship, establishing trust, um, and, and really working on, on that connection with older adults. So um, I know the person that's working in that program right now is like, man, I need to find some more volunteers. So um, that's kind of a focus for LSCO right now is, is working on um, where do we target and how do we find people that are willing to take the time to do that. So if you are interested, we would be happy to speak with you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Ian Hurdle, and first of all, Heather, I think you caught up to Rob on your presentation oh, ability. Thank you. <laughs> so you can see there's excitement and things have come together under a hard situation. What I'm interested in is your success spreading out where the surrounding communities are now asking you for advice how to do it. Um, sure. Um, so some of you may know that there's boundaries that come along with funding um, and so that becomes a bit of a challenge when the funder only allows you to drive your car to a certain street in Lethbridge and you can't go beyond that street um, and so our obviously most um, closest areas is um, Coaldale, Colhurst, Pitcher Butte, or, or, um, within the Barron, Eureka, Warner, FCSS area. Um, and so we've had a lot of conversations about this exactly because a lot of the smaller towns, um, their older adults are coming into Lethbridge for resources, uh, their doctors are here, their um, supports are here, um, and, and they have staff, they have programs, um, but they have acknowledged you know that their ability to support complex um, challenging situations they're um, lacking in that area so they definitely phone and we offer suggestions and we try to help them um, troubleshoot without driving into their cities <laughs> their towns um, but we both have acknowledged that there's valuable um, ability there for us to support them and for them to support us because we're sharing the same people anyways so yeah so, so yeah. So what what Heather what Heather didn't say is that um, they don't turn people away. So I want to make this really clear: they don't turn people away. And so we've we've developed a service attitude here um, some years ago. Um, no one here from the city of Lethbridge is there. <laughs> so and, and she said there are jurisdictional issues about funding, and city of Lethbridge doesn't want their taxpayer dollars going to serve someone in in Coldwell or Colhurst. However, um, if someone comes to see Heather's team and they drive into Lethbridge and we don't know where they live actually, um, then these guys will help them. And, and it's, it's actually, I know it might sound funny that we have to do that like on the sly, but um, I've been working for several years, actually more than several years, a number of years to try to get the city to allow us to serve people in the surrounding areas. I even talked to the executive director for FCSS in Edmonton, and, and she said, there's nothing stopping you from doing that other than your own, your own municipality. And, and it's this whole thing about, wait a second, if, if we can serve more people, um, even if it is a little bit of taxpayers' dollars from the left bridge, they're going to come here for service anyway. They're going to come here, and at some point, we're going to have to serve them in Lethbridge in a more um, in a more crisis-based situation or something that's more acute than something that we could help them out now. And they're not going to they're not going to move into Lethbridge. And I think that's a, those are the kind of things that I, I think need to be considered and uh, to need need to be worked on more moving moving ahead. So my name is Mark Gettle. I'm just wondering, like, social prescribing would benefit everyone and you're honing in on seniors. Do you know if there's any programs in Canada that actually are catering to everything, adolescents up, and do you see a day where maybe in Alberta we'll have social prescribing available for everyone? Yeah, I do want to do that. 
<laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so, yeah, there are programs that, that deal with not just seniors, and, and when we do our national um, calls on the National so Institute of Social Prescribing, um, there are people that talk about dealing with families and um, um, dealing with kids and, and things like that. One of the best um, illustrations that we've had about social prescribing came from Dr. Marianne Essam. She's the lead uh, the lead for social prescribing with the National Health Service in, in UK. And her, her story is how simple social prescribing can work for anybody. So one thing was um, there was a guy that the, their link worker, which is like Heather Staff, was working with a gentleman. Um, he wasn't in contact with his kids and he was getting more and more depressed all the time. So when the link worker work, went to his house, and this guy was in his late 30s, early 40s, um, the link worker went to his house and the, the guy had his, his shades were all drawn and it was dusty and dingy in there and his furniture was all threadbare. And he, so they, they developed a plan to have this guy clean his house up. And they found some furniture to use furniture store and um, he was able to get him into a, a, a job search program and uh, find him some mental health supports. Um, so at the end of the day, after like six months, this guy, he was a new person. Just because this link worker identified some things that this guy needed um, that weren't medical, but improved his um, health outcomes by so much, he was able to get a job and develop a relationship with his kids again. So those are the kind of things I think we can, we can use this kind of work for just about anything, right? Leona Jacobs. So I'm sitting here kind of going, okay, great program, love it. Um, but my thing I can't reconcile is the whole business about people finding their way here. And so you put up a graph, said a lot of people are just self-identifying right now. And that presumes that people see themselves as needing this. And we have a lot, I mean, the, the generation of seniors coming up are the boomer generation, and they're very different than your, you know, the, the sort of stereotypical image of the gray hair, right? Um, so there's that, but also then when you say you want it to come in through the health professional, health professional is a very broad term, and so my mind went, well, okay, who, who do you first interact with is your doctor? but. We have an issue with respect to doctors. And even if you have a doctor, you have an issue where their mindset is, by habit probably, is focused on the medical and not on the social determinants. And they're not even probing those necessarily to know that maybe you don't need a pill, you need to have some help doing something. So how are you gonna reconcile all this? I mean, it's just, I don't see, I see this happening over here and I see, mm -hmm. but I don't see how the intake's gonna happen, so. Yeah, sure. Um, so like I mentioned, there's one clinic that we're working with right now and that's all the Campbell clinics. Um, and so the work that I've done is specifically with an RN and she um, was pretty honest in these things are what I do. <laughs> as a nurse, as the support staff for the physician. Um, so she's often saying this is where this needs to go in terms of community resources and um, the doctors will flag the issue of like, I don't know, there's something else here, I've dealt with this and this, but this isn't something that I know what to do with. And so what she has suggested to me as I'm working to approach all the clinics is that I'm actually targeting the office staff, the support staff, the um, project managers, the clinic managers, that yes, of course, the doctor is instrumental in understanding that there are supports for medical conditions that aren't medical based, um, but she's, she's suggesting that a lot of those conversations are actually held with the RNs that support the doctors. So, and that it would be um, a, a wise way to start, to start to s allow the doctors to see the follow through and the um, benefits that could be gained um, by delivering news back to the referral source, the doctor of like, we dealt with this and this and this, and for them to see that as a component of the care plan. So the other, the other thing, Leon, sorry. 
So the other thing, Leona, is all those other things that Heather talked about, the services that we provide in the partnership, all our in-home supports, and we also do um, income tax preparation, volunteer income tax preparation, and, and that's, al that's almost always a flag when a senior comes in and they haven't um, filed their taxes for more than a year. Because the first question is, why haven't you done it? And then you start probing those kind of questions and, and our volunteers will, will let, let our staff know about that because it, it's an issue, right? Um, and then they can start finding out the other things that are wrong. So um, the, the other thing is, um, that Heather didn't touch on either, is all those other things that we do um, are not necessarily always here. Right, and so when we're on the community and, and we're talking to people, and our elder abuse case managers out talking to people about services they need, even if it's not an elder abuse issue, there's something in that person's life that requires them to need support. Um, we're providing support for a couple hundred more people that prior to 2019 weren't getting any service, and I, I think um, I get what you're saying, but we've come a long way in a few in a few short years. <laughs> Thank you very much. In, in conclusion, and I gave you a heads up on this, I want each of you to give us the quickest elevator talk you can in what us, you want us to take away from all of this. So we'll start with Heather. Okay, sure. Um, so I guess for, for us and the work that we're doing, um, we're really, we really appreciate that uh, for older adults in the community, there's many systems, there's many concerns, there's many challenges that go along as people age. Um, and we really want to be um, ensuring that we're filling gaps and that we're aware of what that looks like. So I appreciate your point about there's a whole new generation of um, seniors coming up and making sure that we're adaptive to that. Um, and so he, knowing that almost every senior I ever speak to tells me I don't want to go into a facility, I don't want to live anywhere other than my own home. Um, I know that that's what we have to continue to do is understand what are those things that you need in order to stay home and how can we deliver them as efficiently as possible. And so engaging the medical system in understanding that there is value in the social supports um, and the social resources as a, a component of care is a, is a valuable option. Good. Make it fast. Bob, Bob said make it fast. You don't give a politician a mic and a tongue would be fast. <laughs> yes, I do. Oh, sorry, Bob. So, so really, my, my, my takeaway for you in all this is that um, um, we have the expertise in Lethbridge to develop these kind of services. We have the knowledge, we have the know-how, we have the people that you don't have to always look somewhere else to see where the experts are. And we've had these discussions in different social service systems forever in Lethbridge. They're always looking somewhere. We've developed a, a best practice for um, seniors outreach and community service in Lethbridge. Um, we've actually been recognized by the Canadian Institute on Social Prescribing in their, in their document that they had produced last summer, the um, summary, it was a summary of social prescribing in Canada, and we were, meant, we were actually given our whole page and highlighted about the work of, of Heather and her team. So I want, that's what I want you to take away from this, is that um, we are ahead of the curve here in terms of senior services. Um, and like I said earlier too, it's uh, one of the most effective service systems that I've seen for a specific target population um, in my 40 years of working in human services. Perfect. So Heather and Rob, thank you very much and everyone join me again in welcoming them or thanking them for such a wonderful presentation. <laughs>